Uh, we'll do some functions, and then we'll get into playing around in the, in the browser console. 6.3 is functions in JavaScript. We mentioned this uh, in the last segment, but functions are closures. So a function is really just a Lambda expression, and you will commonly see in JavaScript lots of places where functions are used as Lambdas. JavaScript is not a purely functional language, but it's quite possible to write code that follows a purely functional style. In the design, uh, JavaScript operates a lot like the programming language scheme. So for those of you who enjoy variants of Lisp, there are aspects of JavaScript that sort of feel right at home. But typically, there's a couple ways to declare a function in JavaScript. We can give it a variable name. So we can say let make times is equal to a function, which takes in some argument. We can return a function. Uh, we can declare a function with the argument, or excuse me, with the name make times. And this makes the function sort of in its current scope, if that's a global scope, it would be a global function. If it's nested, you know, it would be uh, in whatever scope. We can leave off the name of a function, and it can just be an anonymous function, uh, much like lambdas in Ruby and Python. Or in modern JavaScript, we can use new syntax called arrow functions, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But essentially, these operate like functions in most other dynamic languages that you're used to. Is They're closures, they capture the variables of their parent scope, we can return new functions, whether anonymous or explicit, and pass functions around as data. So arrow functions in JavaScript are mostly shorthand, and they're especially used for inline functions. You'll see lots of places where people now use arrow functions as the default, but there's a few different ways of writing them, and there's one uh, sort of big catch to arrow functions that is worth highlighting. So in this case, if we want to give the function a name, we say function name is equal to, and the function syntax itself is an argument, arrow, what sometimes gets called the hash rocket in, in Ruby, but it's, you know, equals greater than, and then the return value. If we leave off the curly braces, arrow functions in JavaScript have implicit returns. It is the only place in JavaScript where there are implicit returns in, in functions. Everywhere else, including the more uh, sort of expanded syntax for arrow functions, which has explicit parentheses around our arguments list and uses curly braces. If we have multiple lines or if we use curly braces, return is not implied and we have to explicitly use the return statement. But for the most part, arrow functions are one of those things that you'll see a lot in JavaScript because uh, there is a tendency to use functional paradigms for manipulating web pages. If I have a simple array, one, two, three, I can write something like array.map of a function. And what does this very simple function do? x times x, no curly braces. This returns you know, x squared. And so what do I get back? A new array. If you like paradigms like map, filter, and reduce, you'll feel right at home in in JavaScript, if you like Ruby's each block, there is a for each function in JavaScript, which works very similarly. Each of these things as well, JavaScript is very forgiving about matching and allowing functions that have multiple arguments to be called appropriately. So there's a lot of useful functionality here. Commonly, when we structure code, we'll store functions as properties in an object to structure a sort of a module of, of shared functionality. So if I have an object here called RP, I might have a setup function I might have a get movie info function. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm just grouping related functions into a common, commonly defined object such that uh, I'm aware of where that functionality lives. You would probably perhaps save this in a file called rp.js in the JavaScript folder of your Rails app. And you might similarly have, you know, a movies.js file or something else. There's, you know, a lot of different techniques for how you break stuff down, but essentially the goal is group-related functionality as properties of an object that you can call on later. You could also use inline definitions on, on your properties, and so this is another common syntax. All of these examples are just two different ways of writing the same JavaScript. Which you use kind of depends on the particular style of your code base, but you'll see both of them out in the world. So we've been talking a lot about objects in JavaScript. JavaScript has an object-oriented system, and objects have inheritance options. 
Um, but it's probably different than the object-oriented code you're used to. Object inheritance in JavaScript is based on the system called prototypal inheritance, where every one of these objects, whether you declare it as a class or not, has a prototype, which is commonly sort of defined in the browser as this double underscore proto attribute. And this proto attribute allows JavaScript to look up attributes or properties from parent objects. And so in JavaScript, most of the time this is done behind the scenes, but an object can inherit its prototype, which includes both its values and its functions uh, from another object. So this is called prototypal inheritance or differential inheritance. In practice, you can use it similarly to most object-oriented interfaces, but there are you know, some differences in terms of how it works behind the scenes. But there is a class system in JavaScript. Modern JavaScript does actually have a class syntax, but really it's just syntactic sugar around the prototypal inheritance that exists under the hood. So classes in JavaScript, they are not quite like classes in Ruby or Python or especially actual Java, but you can write them in a somewhat similar way and you can get by with you know, the majority of the time sort of treating them like other classes. But technically behind the hood, all of these classes have prototypes that exist. So with the class syntax in JavaScript that you'll see in some cases, you declare with class, a class name, and curly braces. And inside, you define a special function called constructor. So this is one of the newer bits of JavaScript where the function name constructor is a special function just like initialize is in Ruby. So you can declare a movie class in a JavaScript file just like this, and we'll play with this in a console in a bit. But the idea here is if I want to represent a movie object natively in JavaScript, you know, this one works a little bit differently than our database model, but I might call it class movie. It has a constructor, which takes in a title, a year, and a rating. Properties on, a, uh, on an object uh, use this, so it's equivalent to Ruby's self. So these are you know, what we can sort of think of as instance attributes. And then we declare instance methods just as functions within our class definition. So I could have a function OK for kids or a function called full title, uh, which accesses the other instance methods. So here I've written these functions two different ways. They work exactly the same way. A typical function, which has a function name, uh, curly braces, and returns uh, some expression. This one happens to be using a regular expression. or we can use arrow functions where I set a name, arguments, arrow, and then whatever the return value is, if there's no curly braces. And this example here just uses string interpolation, just showing the title and a year in the same string. So this is uh, how classes work in JavaScript. If we want to extend built-in classes, you'll see this a lot in certain libraries. Similar to how Rails extends native Ruby objects, you can extend native JavaScript objects by expanding their prototype. So there is no default zip method on an array in JavaScript, but you could define your own. This one just you know, squishes two arrays together, but you can now call array.zip on any array if you were to do something like this. Depending on your application, you may be using a library that expands the functionality automatically. But it's dynamic, just like Ruby, so if we modify the the array object, then every single array you know, gets the benefit of, of new functions. So one thing to be aware of in JavaScript uh, is uh, when we construct uh, class objects. And sometimes this is you know, described as one of the single biggest design flaws in JavaScript, which is if we call a function new, saying new movie, or commonly new date, this creates a new object whose internal name, this, is the prototype of whatever function prototype we called. So by saying new, it's our way of essentially declaring a new instance of a class. But JavaScript lets you get away without using new. And so if you just call a function on the object, you might get something else, which is bound to a different object. And so if you call a function, what we say without a receiver, then uh, without specifying new, then this binds itself to the global object. And in practice, this sounds a little bit tricky, but in a demo, we'll show you, it's pretty straightforward. If you're working with a class system in JavaScript, something that is meant to be treated as an object with instance methods, you use the keyword new, 
to, to create new instances. And if you have a function which just returns some data, you don't have to worry about the object structure. The, the problem is understanding what the API expects, and that's going to be something that we'll talk about how to learn. The downside here is that if you call something without new that expects you to use the keyword new, you just get a return value of undefined. So there are ways to check for gotchas in JavaScript, but we'll see in a moment what this looks like. So here is some rewrite of the demo code, but what we'll do is work in a browser. 